Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Professor Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com, going over Lesson 6.6 .6 in the Organic Chemistry 2 Primer. The focus of this lesson will be on assessing how neutral nucleophiles like water and alcohols can react with aldehydes and ketones. Now, a neutral molecule like water is not a very good nucleophile. So generally, these reactions will have to employ an acid catalyst which is used to protonate the carbonyl to make it active enough that sort of a poor nucleophile like water will be able to facilitate addition. After you do the addition of water and there are some proton exchange steps, you will get an OH that's been added from water and the OH from the initially present carbonyl. And of course you don't change any of your R groups at that point. And this is what is known as a hydrate. Now notice if you have an acid catalyst, you could actually have protonation of that OH group and another molecule of water could come in and replace that. So you don't necessarily have the initial oxygen from the carbonyl left over after you've allowed this process to take place. Now how would one figure that out? How do you tell if one OH has been replaced by an OH from somewhere else? Well we can use water where we've taken the O18 heavier isotope of oxygen and we use this water that's labeled with this particular isotope of oxygen. And then we can tell whether or not we have replacement of the initial carbonyl with the O18 labeled OH groups. So if you do the first replacement, really that's a type A reaction. If we do the second replacement, where let's say we used O18 labeled water for both steps, you could very easily tell that you don't have the initial carbonyl oxygen anymore. We call those type D reactions. In either case, when you take an aldehyde or ketone, the molecule you get has two OH groups and of course will maintain the two not good leaving groups that were flanking the carbonyl carbon to begin with. As with many examples where we see water acting as a nucleophile, we can instead use an alcohol as that nucleophile. And this again requires the presence of an acid catalyst. So you'll usually see cat H plus or maybe you see H2SO4 catalytic, maybe some specific example of an acid. In any case, you need to activate that carbonyl to react with a poor nucleophile like water or an alcohol. But then once you do that, you can have addition of the alcohol and you'll get a species that looks like this, where this was the carbonyl oxygen that we'd started with. And then after deprotonation, you would have what is called the hemiacetal or the hemiketal. Now the hemiacetal is what you call it if you've made it from an aldehyde. So that's where Y is an H. It's called a hemiketal if you've made this from a ketone where you have some carbon-based R group there instead. The thing about these acetals and ketals is that if there's a little bit of acid around, you can protonate that OH group and make it into a good leaving group. This is not especially surprising because we learned about alcohols before. If I have an alcohol, several of the reactions we learned started with the reaction of the alcohol with a strong acid like HBr or sulfuric acid. To protonate that OH to make it into a H2O unit, it can act as a good leaving group. So if we have some acid around, when we have a hemiacetal or hemiketal, it will protonate the OH group just like we saw way back in lesson 2.11 for the reaction of alcohols in this way. Now the fact that we have this other OR group on here already means that once we make this positively charged oxygen, it's relatively easy to push this off. We don't need an external reactant to do this. So the water comes off and we're left with the R double prime and the Y group of course still on the carbon and then this OR group at the bottom is now doubly bound with its R group still but that oxygen is not especially stable anymore because you have a positive charge. So what happens? You've got this hemiketal or hemiacetal. Well what else is floating around the solution? If we're making a hemiacetal or hemiketal we've added alcohol. So what will happen is that a second molecule of the alcohol will be attracted very strongly to that carbon in box B. So the arrow pushing will be just like 
the other nucleophilic attacks on a carbonyl type carbon, C double bond to O, you get this species. And this is sort of the alcohol I drew in in red. Now this B, this base, it could be another molecule of water or anything that's a proton acceptor to pull the proton off. And now the net result is that we've added two OR groups in place of what used to be the carbonyl carbon attached to that carbon group. That means this overall reaction is a type D reaction. I hope you remember from lesson 6.3 the type D reaction is any reaction in my sort of nomenclature about this where you remove the carbonyl oxygen. And every one of these steps is reversible. So I want to point out something you can write in the notes panel of the slides for this lesson. Any reversible reaction that can reach equilibrium is subject to what we call Le Chatelier's principle. Here we need an acid catalyst to facilitate pushing these OR groups or the OH groups on and off of the compound. Let's say I want to push my reaction as far to the right side of the equilibrium as possible. Well, there are a couple ways we could do this. The OR pieces needed for the reaction come from an alcohol. A good way to push the reaction to the right is to add an excess of the alcohol so that consuming the alcohol will lead to production of product. You want to consume things that are present in excess. That's part of Le Chatelier's principle. The other part of Le Chatelier's principle we could use is that if we remove something from one side of the reaction, right? Over here we're using the strategy of adding a bunch of reactant. We could distill the water away by attaching a distillation head to the flask, boiling the water away, leaving the product behind. Now, as this is removed, you shift the equilibrium to the right because it's missing some of the products. On the other hand, let's say we have this ketone and we want to get the ketone back from it. Well, all we would have to do, if we have this pure ketone, is not add any alcohol, instead add a bunch of water, because that's a reactant to go in that direction. So this reaction is reversible and can be pushed in either direction depending on what we're trying to accomplish. The fact that this reaction is so reversible has led scientists to do something very clever, and that is to use these ketals or acetals in what are called protecting groups. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a scientist and you want to do a nucleophilic attack, say an SN2 reaction, and have a nucleophile attack and push this bromine off, and you want that product. If you also have a carbonyl in this molecule, it's a pretty common situation. Well, we just went through a lot of trouble to talk about how nucleophiles love to attack carbonyl carbons. So now your nucleophile is sitting there. It's probably going to do whichever one of these reactions it happens to come closest to first. If it comes closest to this carbon over here, it'll probably start the SN2. If it happens to come close to this carbon, oh, it's going to say, well, I'm attracted to that carbon. I'm going to do that reaction. How do you get one specific reaction of two possible reactions that could take place like that? One possibility is to do a reaction that only one of these two groups is capable of accomplishing. So if I take this alcohol, where I've got two alcohols here, and I know I can put two alcohols on the carbonyl carbon. So this is going to attack, something's going to happen. Later, the second alcohol can also attack. And what we'll get is the ketal. So here's where the double bond O was. Here's the bromine. This is the, the reaction with the OH group. First alcohol goes on. Second alcohol is hanging out right here. Right in the previous page we had OR, OR, and they both attached. Here the two alcohols happen to be attached to each other as well. But by making this ketal in this way, and I should mention that using this alcohol, it's called ethylene glycol, is very, very common for ketal formation on organic chemistry exams as well as in real life labs. So whatever your goal is, it's worth noting. What we've accomplished here is this carbon no longer has a good leaving group on it. The bromine good leaving group is still there, so when we add a nucleophile, it can very nicely push the leaving group out doing the SN2 reaction. And we call this ketal group now a protecting group, because now it's protecting that carbon from being attacked, when if we hadn't put it there, that site is susceptible to nucleophile attacking. Well, that's all fine and good, except I start out by saying, what if I wanted to replace this with a nucleophile? I didn't say we wanted to also get rid of this carbonyl. What if we want to do some ketone reaction that we learn? Well, 
I went to a lot of trouble to tell you that the reaction to make the ketal is reversible. How do we get it to go back to the ketone? We just add a little acid catalyst and a bunch of water. Having that big excess of water by Le Chatelier's principle will push us back to that site right there, that site that was the ketal. That will cause that to become the ketone again. The rest of the molecule will be unfazed by these conditions. So we'll still have our alkyne sitting here. Now we can go and do any of the reactions we learned in section three for alkynes, or we can do any of the reactions we've learned or will learn about ketones. And it was made possible by protecting one of the two sites that was susceptible to nucleophilic attack from the beginning.